Yeah, so I actually worked on the first recovery trial that I think Fiona mentioned, which was a feasibility trial um, back quite some time ago now. Um, fantastic learning experience for me. It was part of a broader um, grant looking at recovery in psychosis and bipolar led by um, Professor Tony Morrison in Manchester. Um, and when I spoke to Steve about this, I think what I wanted to do was try to reflect on the process of recovery-focused therapy from the perspective of a therapist. So what conversations have I had with clients? Um, what are the things that have come from this work that are important? Um, what processes do we go through to work towards recovery with somebody um, in therapy? And I hope I can put some of those themes together um, today to, to share with you. Um, so I suppose just the word recovery, um, it's an interesting term, there's, there's lots of different um, meanings. I think um, some people might not relate to the term recovery for a start, so I guess when we start therapy it's just about really uh, sitting with the person to find out what it is that they want from therapy, whether this term recovery means anything to them, um, and if it does, what is that? Um, it's more broadly a philosophy, and I think we've heard a lot about it today, about that process of not just focusing on the problems that maybe people have then been treated for in other, other types of relationships with health professionals, um, but it's a philosophy, it's an ethos, it's a set of principles, um, and it's something that hopefully can offer somebody a way forwards. But again, I think my job would be to think about that, but also work with the person in terms of their language, um, whether recovery means something to them or not. But I think fundamentally it, it's a process. An anchoring point in therapy is to make sure that what we're doing is relevant to the person that we're working with. Not only relevant, but we're actually engaged in a process that's per uh, meaningful for that person. It's working towards what we've spoken about, functioning, living a meaningful life. Um, and, it, and it's something that I guess my job in therapy is to keep coming back to that as an anchor point. Um, and to listen as well to the person I'm working with because it's possible that as a therapist I've got lots of background, I've, I've, I've been in a therapy before, I may be taking it in a place that's, that's not exactly where that person wants to be. So it's a constant reminder to listen um, to what the person wants. Um, I think first of all to enable this um, we've got to develop what, what we call therapeutic relationship, what really is just getting to know each other and making sense of this thing called therapy. Um, I've seen lots of people as a therapist now, but the person, it may be their first time in therapy, they may have had previous experiences of therapy, um, they may have heard lots of things about what therapy is or seen it on the telly. Um, I remember early on struggling with somebody in, in terms of knowing where we were going with therapy and I asked him what his view of therapy was and it was that he'd shut his eyes and, and I'd talk and I'd sort something out in the back of his mind and then he'd be able to, to get on with the things that he currently couldn't do. Um, I think people are told a lot about therapy before we get a chance to meet. So people are told, oh, this therapy will sort this out for you or go and speak to James, he'll be able to, he knows a bit about mood swings or... Um, it might, might have been sold as something that, that almost is the last chance, last chance saloon. Um, so I've learned over the years that I've been doing this now just to unpick what this thing called therapy means, but then to think together about making it into something that, that the person wants um, and that we've got a dual responsibility to do that. So I can let them know what's within the range of things that I would see as my role but they've got a stake in defining this as well. It's an individual process. Um, the people I'm speaking to, they might be um, you know, thinking about this, trying to check out what, what this thing called therapy is. How could that possibly relate to my life? Coming to see you in a room or you coming to my house for an hour, how does that relate to everything else? Um, I might be using jargon and they're thinking, how does that relate to me? Um, ultimately, I guess, they think, is it going to help? Can this help? And again, that responsibility of meeting in the middle. How do what, what we're doing together, how can that help you get where you want to be? Um, I think we need to keep coming back to that. Um, 
I should have said, I think one of the things that I do bring in my role is, I guess, as a clinical psychologist, I've learned about what's possible. Um, we, we learn lots of things. I guess we learn what's normal. And there's many, many experiences out there that are quite common that people are happy to share. But there's a lot of other experiences that are common that people are not happy to share. And they're the experiences that we feel alone with. We don't talk about them. There's no way of having that conversation. And I think therapy, we're in a very privileged position because we get to look at the research that's out there um, on what people are experiencing. I've seen some wonderful examples of that today. But also I've, I've listened to a lot of other people now talk about those experiences that they don't feel they can share initially um, and that they feel isolated with. And that recovery as well from a psychological perspective is that we'd understand that this might be explainable in terms of normal processes which could be quite revolutionary somebody might feel and might have got the message that for some reason they've got something that makes them different and so in therapy what we're trying to do is think about how do normal human processes result in these experiences I think it's really really important um, if you're setting off on a journey how do you make the small decisions if you don't know where it is you want to end up um, and just sitting with this idea of goals and one of the things that I've learned is a lots of different types of goals there's goals that people think they should achieve and they can often be the ones that people come with at the start of therapy and when you dig down it's not something that they feel in the pit of the stomach that they want but it's maybe something that where they feel they should be in life um, there's goals about people wish for and more to do with dreams some goals are about not having something as well. So um, a classic one could be, I want to go to the gym. Um, but when you dig down, it's not, the gym isn't really something the person enjoys, but they don't want to feel quite so bad about themselves. So it's just about constantly going back to what a person wants and are we getting there in what we're doing? I think this, this develops over the course of therapy as well. Um, the person may, um, come to me and say I want to work on my mood swings because they're in a service they've been told this therapy is about that and they think that's what's on offer but there might be lots of things to do with functioning and recovery that actually they really want and working on the mood swings is not the goal it's a means to an end um, it's what they want to do to get where they want to be and I think it's really important as well um, somebody said to me recently in, in CBT um, I find it really difficult because you don't get to know the person and I, I found that sort of quite strange because to me that early phase is about me just really listening, trying to work out, um, to get to know the person, to get to understand their lives and then to think about how we can help. Um, but I think the goals could be for the person to find out themselves about themselves, about thinking about identity and values and to constantly reflect on that process. Um, it, mood swings as we've, we've discussed today um, this may be the reason why a person is in the service it might be a key difficulty for that person um, but it may not be a problem for that person or it may not be something they want to work on um, and it's really really important that that I have that conversation with somebody at the start that this isn't what you have to work on we need to understand you know where it is that you want to go um, and if it is, it might be that, that ambivalence or that mixed feeling about those mood swings, that there's elements of this process that are much valued, but there's elements that are a little bit, a little bit more difficult. Um, and we just need to come back to the person's goals and values. I think another key element for me as well, and, and this is something that I need to make people aware of in the therapy, is that we can work on, on where a person wants to go, but it needs to be anchored in terms of making sure that we're, we're looking at risk and safety. Um, and it becomes, might become a problem when those goals are mismatched. I think the classic, the classic moment in this is that I, I can't always go with people's the goals that they tell me. If they tell me that they want to hurt themselves or kill themselves, then I need to and take a slightly different approach there. But I think what happens often when you sit with that is that you can work out a way of standing with a person that actually they don't want to feel bad anymore and that might be something that I could help with. The way that we do that, we may differ on, but we're gonna move in the same direction to achieve something. 
Um, and I've put exits and memory rescripting there. I think one of the reflections I've had, I also worked on a suicide prevention trial at roughly the same time that I worked on this trial. And I think what we're really good at in, in therapy is formulating how a person and understanding how a person gets into distress and what keeps that going. Um, but we don't often continue that conversation to, to understand how the person naturally got out of that situation themselves, if, if in fact they did. Um, and what we might be doing is strengthening the focus and the memories of those difficult times. And I, I think this is something for me in recovery focused work to have conversations really focusing on how people themselves have solved the problems and whether we could build the interventions around that. I think one of the other things that I've learned is, is um, do we miss things that, that, that just don't come through our normal assessment process in therapy? Um, but I'm a, I guess I'm a mental health professional working as part of the community of mental health professionals and that person may have had a difficult history with mental health services around having decisions, choices, autonomy taken off them. And also they may have had um, experiences in life where they haven't felt that been able to make the, the key decisions for them. So I suppose this idea of freedom um, and what's been taken away from a person and how can we do all we can to protect that? Um, what does it mean to people? And is it something that's traditionally asked about and how can we help within the therapy? Um, and I think within that framework, um, what I can bring is my experience of delivering what are evidence-based therapies. So I think once we decide we know where we're going to go, we've formed this alliance together that we want to get there. And then I can say, well, the things that I can use to help you, there's evidence to show that it, it has helped other people. And that's something that particular to psychological therapy that, that we can offer. Um, there's a specific approach for mood swings, which Sophie summarised. Um, but it's important that that's in service of what's important to you. Um, it's, it's not the end itself. Um, one of my best supervisors ever was a client who I saw on the recovery trial. Um, and for that person, it was incredibly important that I was in the room with her not thinking about something else. And she was incredibly sensitive to it. So if, I, if we were having a conversation and then I looked to think about it or think how to bring cognitive therapy, she would say textbook, you're in your textbooks again. And for her, she had very difficult experiences in her life of not being listened to, of people not being present, of people trying to think what she needed. And actually for her, it was just so important that I remained in that room for that hour with her and I listened and I still hear her now in my head saying textbook when I lose that with my clients. There was also a parrot that used to swear in the corner of the room as well, so it was, it was a pretty challenging uh, experience for me. Um, yeah, and I think that just comes back to, am I listening, am I present? And from that basis, can I then offer what, what evidence shows has helped people? So there's my summary of the principles so far. This is where I'm up to in thinking about this, but I can see you at the break, respond to emails.